So today we will move from reverse to a more seismotectonic issue or morphotectonic issues, uh, trying to uh, look at the information than that the landscape and in particular that the geomorphic markers can bring about the underlying uh, tectonics, whatever it is, uh, horizontal motion or vertical motion. But I will slightly more emphasize on the vertical motion, in particular in, uh, on first fold and end fold. So the question is how we can uh, deduce the uh, deformation rate of the upper crest just at uh, measuring deformation of a surface object like geomorphic markers. So we have uh, several approaches when we are interested in the, uh, documenting the deformation and it's depending at which time scale you are interested to work. So basically, if you want to document the long-term deformation of a mountain range or a fold, you will be using, or a continent, we will be, you will be using techniques like paleomagnetisms, structural geology, thermobarometry, thermochronology. If you're interested, it's much shorter time uh, evolution of the orogen for the last million years. Then you will be using what we call low temperature thermochronology, mostly to document the denudation rate. And when you begin to be more interested in the recent activity or present activity, then you will switch to a morphotectonics technique, then paleoseismology, if you are looking for faults, and for the very recent deformation, and in particular to characterize the seismic cycle and the deformation during seismic cycle, then there are multiple techniques that goes toward geophysics like geodesy and seismology. So basically, we can have, uh, we, we can want to document horizontal motion or vertical motion or both. And some techniques are quite well adapted for uh, to document horizontal motion and will give no information or on vertical deformation. So on the long term, for example, so you are all familiar with the, uh, seafloor spreading rate documented by a magnetic stripe at the bottom of the ocean. So typically the use of the paleomagnetism information to know the horizontal rate. On, a, on continental surface, it is also commonly used on continents, on blocks inside the continents to document rotation, motion, uh, relative to latitude and, for example, on this uh, uh, example of the Altiplano, for reconstruction or retro deformation of uh, um, some continent based on the paleomagnetisms or on structural geology. But in that case, again, we are mostly documented horizontal motion and we don't get any kind of information on vertical deformation. And sometimes vertical deformation is quite important to know. So it can bring information on what's going on, for example, in a collisional zone. It's if the Tibet is rising at three kilometers, four, five, or six, gives information about, for example, the rheology and the viscosity of the crust that can maintain such uh, uh, elevation. So knowing the history of the uplift of the Tibet can be uh, important to document the response of the upper crust and the mantle to deformation. It can be interesting also to know, for example, the uh, 
history of the vertical, uh, uh, the vertical motion of the Himalaya or of the Tibet to document when the monsoon started uh, exactly during, uh, uh, during the last uh, 50 million years uh, since the collision. So for this kind of uh, questions, we need in some, some way uh, to document the, uh, the uplift on the long term. To document the uplift on the long term, there are not so many uh, possibilities and mostly you have to rely on either pressure or temperature, which are two variables. We are strongly dependent on, uh, on, the, uh, on the elevation. So after that, if you want to have an idea of the uplift of a surface of a place, you need to find some way to record the temperature or the pressure. So just it's a matter of uh, demonstration. The evolution of the pressure with elevation. So at Everest level, Everest mountain top, uh, pressure is uh, a third of pressure at sea level. And for temperature, you also all experience probably going up in the mountain, but uh, the temperature is decreasing by five to seven degrees, depending on the latitude. Uh, five to seven degrees for each kilometer of elevation. So if you are able to measure paleo temperature or paleo pressure, you can get an idea of paleo vertical position. So there are different paleo altimeter proposed in the literature. Some are based on pa uh, recording paleo pressure. So you can record paleo pressure by looking at gradient of gas bubbles in volcanic lava flow. You can look also for fossil cosmogenic exposure that give you an idea of the uh, thickness of the atmosphere above you, above your sampling point. And some people have tried to look also at the size of stomata in the, in the plants. But uh, most of the paleoaltimeter uh, used in the literature are based on the, sorry for that, uh, from, on the temperature variation. So it can be, paleo, uh, historically, it was mostly based on paleofauna and paleoflora, uh, considering that they are linked to uh, temperature. More recently, people have pr uh, produced, uh, proposed paleoaltimeter based on temperature reconstruction based on uh, delta 47, which is uh, isotopologues. I, I, don't, I will not speak about that uh, today. And uh, I would say most studies use paleoaltimeter based on the uh, isotopic signature of the oxygen, uh, delta O18, which is sensitive in particular to, uh, to temperature through a distillation uh, of the clouds when they are climbing in the, in the atmosphere. But it's not the topic of the day. It's just uh, to show you that we have different tools or different techniques when we want to uh, look at vertical deformation on the long term. But today, I will be much more interested in documenting the active fall uh, uh, deformation. And for that, uh, we will be uh, using mostly for documenting long term the morphotectonic techniques and to study seismic cycle we can rely also on classical uh, paleoseismology and geodesy in seismology. So very quickly, when we speak about active fault, uh, we think deformation in the upper crust that accommodate or respond to deformation uh, in the lower crust or in the mantle uh, as produced by uh, mantle dynamics. So those deep viscous movement generate strong stress at the base of the uh, upper crust. And after some stage, the uh, stress are too high and you break your upper crust. So you get some earthquakes. And 
usually people will uh, describe this behavior in term uh, in the uh, in the crest in term of uh, seismic cycle. So during an earthquake, you have a rupture of the upper crust, and during or during the interseismic period, in between the earthquakes, you will have deformation in the ductile uh, lower crust. And on the long term, if you sum the two, co-seismic and interseismic deformation, you will end up with a, a slip on the fault, which is a long-term slip. So depending what you're interested uh, in doc documenting in, it's if it is co-seismic, interseismic, or long term, you, you, will, you will use different techniques or different approach. Typically for co-seismic, we will use seismology or geodesy. In comparison, for long term, we will use morphotectonic technique. So again, a diagram with a time scale. So for documenting very rapid deformation, We'll use seismology or ge geology, geology for longer term deformation uh, that average several seismic cycles. Then we can use paleo seismology, so here a trench in paleo seismology, or we can use um, morphotectonics techniques I will develop later on. So, very quickly, because you are all familiar with that. So for now, uh, more than 20 years, uh, geoscientists are using uh, GPS uh, as a special geodesy to document deformation rate. So for example, on this image, we can see the vector of displacement relative to stable North America. So here, California. And you see that the Western coast is moving north westward relative to North America interior. And if we look at a section like that, so we can document with GPS the interseismic deformation uh, across the uh, St. Andreas Fault. So we have a displacement around 35 millimeter. And presently, because we are in the, in the, during the interseismic period, we get some sleeping or ductile uh, uh, sliding at depth until 20 kilometer, then the upper part of the fault above 20, uh, in the upper 20 kilometer is completely locked. And what we observe at surface during the interseismic period, it's just elastic deformation accommodated or um, building up in the, in the upper crust. With GPS, we can document also the co-seismic deformation, so it can be close to a fault or even far from the rupture. So this is a rupture in the Sumatra subduction. And you can see on the three components, vertical component in green and mostly in the east, east component, east-west component in blue, you can see a deformation. So here it's uh, around 20 centimeter following these uh, earthquakes in 2004. To document the deformation, we can rely also on a, a remote sensing uh, uh, techniques. So one of them is based on the radar interferometry. So I don't know if you are familiar with that, but a satellite is sending a wave in the radar uh, uh, wavelength domain. And there is some uh, reflection on the Earth's surface. And later on, for example, after an earthquake, the same satellite can come back and take another slightly uh, a, a, the same picture, the same image, or almost the same image, almost in the same position. And by comparing the uh, the time of response in some way, we can construct interferograms 
comparing the two images, interferograms of the deformation, which is presenting as fringe, fringes of interferences that correspond to fringes of, uh, in, well, there are several corrections to do, like topographic correction, atmospheric correction, but afterwards, after all this correction, we end up with uh, interferograms of the fringe of deformation related to the surface deformation in between the two images. And wrap, unwrapping those deformation fringe, we can get the total deformation. Each, uh, for example, for the satellite ERS, the European satellite ERS, each fringe of deformation represents around 20 millimeters of deformation. And what we are documenting, it's a deformation in this direction. It's in, it means in the direction the uh, satellite is looking at their point on Earth. And so usually it's slightly oblique. So the deformation you get, it's not horizontal, nor vertical, but just a mix of the two. So historically, the first, the first time that uh, uh, this uh, kind of uh, interferogram have been built to document co-seismic uh, deformation was for the uh, uh, for the Landers earthquakes, I'm um, trying to remember. So, and uh, I don't remember the date exactly, but the paper is, uh, ah, yes, it's Landers earthquakes in 92, and the paper uh, was in 93 by Massonet. So, for the first time, they were able to build this interference fringe and use it as some kind of tool to document the deformation of the Earth's surface. So, in that case, it's a uh, strike sleep fault, so the deformation is mostly related to the uh, co-seismic deformation uh, associated to the strike sleep uh, earthquakes. And on the on the right, there are synthetic uh, fringe produced by some elastic uh, model uh, with a rupture along this fault. Other technique, slightly more recently, have been uh, proposed. I will not go to, into the detail, but it's called optical subpixel cross collation. So you are comparing two images uh, are taken again more or less with the same angle of view at the same uh, at the same time in the day. And if one point, if you get some deformation by a fault, then you will get a point here which has deplaced compared to the initial images. And comparing and making some cross correlation uh, in between the two images, you will be able to document a slight shift, either in the x direction or in the y direction, and produce a map of deformation. So typically, the precision of this kind of technique, it's you can document displacement, which are of the order of 10% of the pixel size. So if you are working with an image which has a pixel uh, of 10 meter, like old spot images, then you can document deformation of one meter. If you are working with more recent images, uh, like a quick bird or other one, which has a resolution of one meter or 0.5 meter, then you can end up with a, a precision of 0.5. 0 0.05 or 0 0.01 meter. So just a, an image of the technique. You see for the Chichi earthquake, so in Taiwan, so a map of the deformation. So you can evidence with this technique deformation or displacement much more important in the north than in the south. And you can see also here the white arrows. The white arrows correspond to the GPS station. So you can see immediately the advantage of the uh, uh, satellite image tech based uh, uh, technique. You get a continuous field of deformation. So a complete 2D image of the deformation. In the, main in the uh, same time, if you look at the GPS, you get only punctual information. Here it's another image of the, uh, I don't remember, maybe Landers earthquakes where you get also the field of deformation uh, associated to the 
to these earthquakes, to this co-seismic deformation. And uh, the nice thing with, uh, with this technique, it's you, don't, you, you get precision even very close to the fault. Because if you go back to, for example, the interferometry, when the deformation clo is close to the, uh, close to the fault, the deformation is so high, so important, that the fringe, interferometric fringes, are very close the one to the other one. So you get uh, so much noise and so, uh, so close fringes, but it's impossible sometimes to uh, recover the deformation signal very close to the fault. With this technique, no limitation, you can resolve deformation even of several meters close to the fault. So basically, uh, special geodesists have three tools uh, to work with to document co-seismic and inter-seismic deformation. So inter, uh, radar interferometry, the main advantage is precision, millimeter, and continuous field of deformation, almost dense measurement. With GPS, the advantage are precision, again, of millimeter. You get three components, vertical and horizontal deformation, but the drawback is the measurements are punctual and not so dense. And with optical correlation, the precision is much less than for these two techniques. Uh, at the maximum, uh, it's uh, five to 10 centimeter with present uh, satellite uh, images. You get two horizontal components, and also you get dense, measure, dense measurement and no amplitude, no displacement uh, limitation. You can combine techniques, obviously. So for that reason, the two, uh, the three uh, circles are intersecting. And in particular, uh, if you want to have a continuous uh, field of deformation with a free component, you can use INSAR technique plus optical correlation. So optical correlation will give you the horizontal motion, so X and Y component, and the INSAR will give you some oblique view. So if you have an oblique view and you already know the horizontal component, retrieving the horizontal component, you will end up with a vertical one. So combining the two, you can add the uh, free direction or the free component uh, field of deformation. So typically, uh, I, and I didn't speak about seismology, uh, about the use of uh, broadband seismology or about uh, accelerometer to document the history of the seismic rupture, but basically to study co-seismic deformation, we will be using seismology and geodesy to look at interseismic deformation, as I've shown you for St. Andreas, for example. We can use GPS or satellite uh, imagery. And if we are interested by the long-term deformation, and in particular uh, by averaging several uh, seismic cycles, several ruptures, then we need to work on a time scale which is in between the one of the geodesy, up to maximum 100 years for geology or seismology. And uh, we need to find a way to reach this scale, this time scale of one to 100 kilo years. And this is where we uh, use morphotectonics techniques, mostly based on geomorphic markers. So let's move more precisely to, in that direction. So how to determine the, uh, how to determine the tectonic activity of a region and how to measure the deformation accommodated by, um, by active structure. It can be faults, it can be fold. So the first step, we, we can define uh, four steps. So the four steps, the first step is to recognize at least the active structure you want to study. So, uh, we will see that it's mostly uh, 
the first step, it's mostly using a remote sensing technique, in particular uh, looking at satellite images. The second step, once you have identified your uh, uh, zone of activity, it's to identify the, uh, um, the potential geomorphic markers that are recording the displacement. And it will be useful in particular first uh, qualitatively to define the sense of motion and then uh, to uh, document the sleep rate on this uh, active fault. And to document the sleep rate, we need to go to step three. So to measure the present geometry of the marker and date it. And finally, to get the deformation in step four, we will need to make an hypothesis on the initial geometry of the marker uh, to get the deformation between initial stage and final stage, final stage uh, being the present one. So I insist on this notion of uh, uh, step four because uh, you will see that in some cases, in particular uh, across uh, a discontinuity like a fault, well, the hypothesis behind the notion of initial marker, it's uh, trivial. But uh, in some other cases, in particular for fold deformation or broad scale deformation, then uh, it's not so trivial to uh, guess the initial geometry. And I will show you a few examples about that. So step one, identification of the active structure. So the initial points is basically to look from far away to try to document things. And looking from far away, it's using Im satellite images or aerial photo. And usually it's much easier to recognize active structures from far away than when you just go on the field and you look at the hills in front of you. Obviously, one guide is also the seismicity. It's not an absolute guide, but uh, you can guess that in uh, European shield or in African shield, there is no seismicity and there is probably uh, no so much probability of uh, tectonic activity. So usually for a question of seismic hazard and uh, you will be uh, going uh, to places where historically or instrumentally the seismicity is well documented and tell you that probably uh, you expect some active deformation. Second point, to be able to recognize some deformation uh, at the surface, you need to produce this deformation. And the uh, most obvious subject you can uh, uh, document or recognize its active uh, fault and uh, associated to uh, or associated to active fault, uh, active rupture or recent rupture. So basically, uh, in the majority of cases, the hypocenter of the uh, or the source of the earthquakes is located at let's say around 10 kilometers deep. 10 to 15 uh, kilometers deep, and the rupture will propagate both laterally, a little downward, and upward. If the earthquake is too small, it's let's say magnitude 4, or magnitude 5, or even magnitude 6, then the area of rupture is too small uh, for the uh, rupture to be able to reach the surface. So usually it's again an average. Uh, we need earthquakes larger than uh, magnitude 6 to make some surface rupture. So again, it's an average. For example, um, uh, three months or four months ago in France, there was a, an earthquake. I don't remember exactly the magnitude, maybe 4.5 or 5. But it was a very uh, specific earthquake, and it, it occurred a few kilometers. I think it, uh, the hypocenter was three, four kilometer deep only, and it produced a few centimeters of surface rupture at surface. So in some cases, you can have smaller magnitude that produce uh, rupture, 
but on majority, you need at least a magnitude six, six to, to produce such kind of structure. And this escarpment, well, in some cases, is obvious when there are several meters of displacement. So two cases uh, with, uh, in particular, the lander earthquakes, as we're mentioning, uh, with a rupture surface of several meters that cut the road here. But you can have also thrust fault, so scarp associated to thrust fault. So here you see this track, athleticism uh, uh, track deformed by the Chichi earthquakes in Taiwan, or this nice waterfall produced by the rupture after the same earthquakes in Taiwan. This is a normal fault, and uh, the rupture associated to a, a surface rupture associated to normal fault. And you will see just the fresh one, and this one, after almost 10 years, you see that the scarps begin by degrading, just because uh, a nature doesn't like vertical phases, and usually erosion will uh, erode, makes erosion the steeper part and upper part, and will uh, make some sediment deposit at the base. So slowly and slowly, your uh, scarp degrade. But if you have regular earthquakes, like here in a, a, a Sal Rift in, in Africa, then slowly and slowly, you create uh, potentially a large scarp and, and topographic feature. So Obviously, when you look from far away on the satellite images, you will, re you will recognize uh, uh, such, a, such kind of topographic feature. So I was, as I was saying, uh, the best way to identify the, uh, usually faults is by an in particular strike slip because you have horizontal motion and uh, I will see a few examples of displaced marker, which are more obvious to see in the satellite, satellite images. Uh, so you look from far away. And we can say that tools, on that sense, have been improved uh, since the 70s. In the 70s, the first one to work with the satellite images, we're, work is, we're working with Landsat images, and the initial resolution was 60 to 30 meters. So imagine now you are used to with a nice resolution of 0 0.5 or 1 meter. So it was re, uh, uh, not it was not possible to document small fault with this kind of images, but only very big fault, uh, quite obvious. Then in the 80s, we moved to satellite images with resolution of 10 meter. And now it's classical to have a resolution of one meter to uh, 0 0.5 meter. And uh, one of the uh, revolution in some way was uh, provided by Google Earth that gives to any one of you the possibility to uh, look at any place on Earth with uh, almost everywhere a very good resolution. So just as a matter of comparison, a spot image here with a resolution of 10 meters, and here Econos with a resolution of 1 meter. So it's, it seems like you are looking at the same place, but completely blurred. So uh, uh, it's much easier to recognize things here with a good resolution than with a 10 meter resolution. So. Let's have, uh, let's look at the catalog of the different uh, fault at Earth's surface and, and look at the different example. So strike slip fault. So we have basically horizontal motion. And because of this horizontal motion, what's going on? You will expect a very linear trace of the fault. So the reason is obvious. I mean, if you imagine that you have a fault which is sinuous, then you have 
strong geometrical problems to make it, make it sleep. So in order to sleep relatively well, you need to have some kind of, which is relatively linear. So for that reason, because the motion is horizontal for strike slip, when you look from above, you expect this kind of linear trend. So again, up the Santander asphalt, nice, very straight uh, linear trace. So, okay, we identify the linear trace. We know that we have a strike slip. Then uh, we want to know the sense of motion. Is it right lateral or is it left lateral strike slip? So we can get an idea of that looking at different uh, objects or different indicators. So we can be looking for a displaced geomorphic marker. So for example, uh, here you see some series of fan, alluvial fan, and also here alluvial fan, so an old one, the most recent one. And looking, for example, at the riser or the limit between two fans, you can see that you have a small displacement of this riser. So here we can say that the fault is left lateral or right lateral? Left, left. left lateral, yeah. So we can say that it is left lateral by you, uh, looking at this kind of markers. So if we have a close up, for example, on this uh, fault, I think it's a Kunlun fault, again, we see different markers. So it can be a riser, so a limit of terrace. We see a nice displacement. Another limit of between an old terrace and the younger terrace is here. And we guess even if it's less, uh, less abrupt, uh, we see also some displacement that goes in the same sense. And we can see also a series of ephemeral stream, which seems at least uh, today uh, abandoned uh, or grassy. And we see that also they recorded some displacement. So all these indicators tell us that it's again left lateral. So a close-up view of the of the displacement. And one important thing it's you see that here you have an old terrace, and here you have a younger terrace, and you see that the younger terrace has recorded less deformation and less. Left, uh, less uh, left lateral slip than the upper terrace and older terrace. So the way it works, uh, typically it's uh, at some stage you build the fan, then the river is uh, eroding and carving the fan and creating a terrace of lower level, so we have T3, T2, and then the uh, river is incising again into T3, T3 so we uh, into, into T2, sorry, and uh, T2 is abandoned, and also the riser between T, T, T2 and T3, and this riser is acting like some uh, abandoned uh, marker, and it will deform passively and record the deformation associated to the, to the fault. And we can keep on the same way, abandoning a, a new terrace, T1, and again, T1 will record some deformation and abuse the displacement or the offset between T1 and T2 will be lower than between T2 and T3 because this one is older than this one. So a, an image of, so a field image. So once you have looked at satellite image and documented uh, the trace of the fault and the place where you s seems that the marker are displaced or offset, 
then you can go on the field and look exactly at those terraces and, 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 and look in more details at the offset and the riser of these terraces. They are over indicator of the sense of motion. Sometimes there is not always marker of deformation, fans or terrace riser to indicate the sense of motion. So you have to rely on over, on over observation. I was mentioning that for a, a fall to, to sleep well, you need some linear, uh, uh, linear trace, but it's not always the case. Sometimes you have a small bends in the, in the fault. So obviously, these faults, these bends makes difficulties or geometric difficulties. And here, you see that if you have this motion, then you will get compression. And here, you will get extension. So along the fault, you can find small transpational uh, feature and small transtensional uh, feature or restraining, uh, uh, sorry, transtensional feature and a transpressional feature, so restraining bed or what we call pull apart basin. So here we can see several of this feature and uh, I will show you more in detail in the, in the next slide. Typically here, we have, what do we have here? It's a restraining band or it's a pull apart? It's a, it's a pull apart, yes. So why do you say pull apart? Sorry? Uh, there's a level which is at one meter and it is surrounded by a level of two meters on both sides. So it gives a sense of a, a uh, depression. Yeah, but uh, yeah, we don't know exactly wh what is the sense of motion. The two meter, I don't know if it's this block which is going up or this one. Well, in fact, yeah. From the shadows, you see that probably the sun is coming from that side. So we have some shadow here, which is more marked than on that area. So it can, knowing that the, sh uh, the most, well, this place is uh, take, take, taken in the northern hemisphere, with uh, the sun coming from here, we consider uh, from the relative mark shadow, we can infer that this part is going down and this part is going up. If we don't know in which hemisphere you are, we are looking, there are other indicators. For example, here, you see this white, fish, uh, white uh, stuff. So typically there are streams and it seems that here the stream get stuck in s some small depression. So probably some uh, log uh, form uh, in front of this uh, small normal fold. So there are several indicators, shadows, orientation, and uh, stream deviated and stream uh, log, and uh, that uh, indicate, yes, that it is a depression. So it is a small uh, pull apart basin. So given the fact that the, uh, the fault is uh, more or less, the direction is like that, then we can document the fact that the fault is a left lateral strike slip fault. Sorry. We can observe pull apart at any scale. So it can be uh, 
a few hundred meters or even a few tens of meters for this kind of feature. So again, here we see a small depression with a shadow more marked on the southern part than in the northern part. And also whitish colors that probably indicate that we got some remnant of water or maybe some marsh or well, at least some uh, uh, small depression with maybe evaporation. We can get also at larger scale, so the Dead Sea in, uh, uh, in the Middle East uh, region can be seen as a pull apart along the Levant Fault. So the, the fault is going that way and stepping that way, and we get this pull apart associated to uh, the left lateral motion of the Levant Fault, and in that case, it's the pull apart dimension is around one kilometer long. So again, we can decipher the sense of motion of the fault. Restraining bend. So maybe uh, you can see a different one. So there is one here. How we can, uh, what are the indicators that tell you that we have a growing structure or uplifting structure? There are some incisions. It appears that there are some uh, uh, river incision features along that ridge within, this, within the white uh, yeah. area. So we have a small, very small canyons, or very small, uh, a few meters deep probably. And so a small river that uh, cut into this structure. So if the river has to cut and make small canyon, it means that this part was rising up. And we don't find it on both sides of this structure. So it means that it's very localized. There is another one here. And this one, it's, we, we can see that it's an uplifting structure. So not from the river, but from, in that case, so we are in the northern hemisphere. From the shadows, yeah. So here it's an illuminated face, and here it's a face with a shadow. So it seems that we have some kind of small triangular uh, hill along the fault. So in that case, uh, how is there, uh, what is the sense of motion? So the, the trace is somewhere here and again here. So if we have a restoring bend, it's again left lateral. Okay. So now, uh, if we consider the fault with a vertical motion, so it can be a normal fault or a stress fault. So normal fault can be usually identified according to several observations. So first one, you see it's, it is in the uh, Western US, uh, a normal fault. I don't know if it's uh, in Nevada, I think. You see, well, first you can follow a nice trace of the fault, so it's well marked. But in contrast with the strike slip fault, it's, it's more sinuous. It's not a straight line. And again, the reason is obvious because the motion is mostly in the vertical plan. So in the vertical plan, you need to have some linear structure. But horizontally, even if it's sinuous, it's not a geometric uh, uh, problem for the fault to, to slide. So typically, uh, the trace can be more sinuous for a normal fault. And it will be the same for first fault too. So there are different uh, features, well, in particular in semi-arid uh, or arid region that uh, can permit to document the activity of a normal fault. So usually, well, the foot wall is deeply uh, dissected. Well, it's uh, normal because you have 
one sector which is rising and the other one not. Usually also if it is active, the upper part of the uh, uh, escarpment or the topographic escarpment is uh, steeper at its base than at its upper part. You can observe what we call a typical uh, triangular facet. So the triangular facet, they are like a, a st steep escarpment. We present a triangular uh, geometry because they are delimited by uh, these dissected rivers. And sometimes, so depending on the tip type of material, but it's, if the fault is relatively active, you can find at the base of the escarpment some kind of ribbon, ribbon uh, steeper and fresher, which can be considered as a witness of the last earthquake. So I will show you uh, a few images later. A normal fault in uh, Tibet. So typically you see this different feature I was mentioning. So dissected valley, a steeper base of the, uh, uh, the base of the escarpment, triangular facet, a nice one. Well, we can see also in that case a displaced marker, which is a moraine here, uh, with a few small escarplets or uh, secondary escarpment. And uh, we don't see so much the ribbon, ribbon I was mentioning. So. Again, in China, close to, to Tibet, this nice, typical triangular facet with the escarpment steepness, which is decreasing upward. In fact, the ribbon is uh, better preserved in uh, lithology, at least in Europe. It is the case in Europe. Uh, it is better preserved when the lithology is limestone. And you can see on this normal fault in Greece, so the big escarpment is relatively degraded, except at the base, for the lowest 10 meter, where you see a nice uh, uh, escarpment that corresponds to the fault mirror. A closer view uh, on this kind of scarp uh, in limestone. So this image is from Iran. And uh, you see the last earthquakes have left this mir fault mirror, and you can even see some striation that indicate the sense of motion. So in that case, it's a normal fault with almost a pure normal component. The first fault, so usually the first fault uh, the last uh, the, uh, the fold that leaves the uh, in satellite images the trace the less obvious. So what is the reason? If you consider a normal fold, so you create some motion like that. So after some times it's growing. So usually. We consider that a uh, normal fault will have close to the surface on the upper crust an angle, an average angle of 60 degrees. So it's slightly uh, above the angle of stability. So you can degrade by erosion slightly your, uh, your scarp, but you more or less preserve the geometry of the scarp. So for that reason, you preserve on the landscape and in satellite uh, imagery, the trace of the fault. In contrast, for first fault, what is going to happen? You create, you have an earthquake, you create some topographic step. So this part is completely unstable. So it will fall down and in some way cover the trace 
of the fault. And if you have many earthquakes and a long-term deformation, then you will borrow, uh, bureau completely the, uh, the tip of the fault, uh, the initial tip of the fault at the surface. And for that reason, the tendency, sorry, is to bureau the trace and then make it less clear at the surface. But still in some places, like in the uh, arid uh, uh, northern Tian Shan, you can see the trace, or more or less follow the trace. So here we have a fold, and this fold is broken by a fold, and I don't know if you can see it from uh, where you are, but we see a teeny uh, lineament here, which in fact corresponds to a fold, a first fold that broke uh, the surface and displaced uh, two generations of alluvial fan. So you can see a youngest alluvial fan, a older alluvial fan which is partly dissected. And you see this first fold that reached the surface and cut uh, the two uh, terrace generation. And here you can see that you see this terrace which seems to, to be uplifted and we can infer the presence of some kind of fold but without uh, seeing any uh, fault rupture at surface. And you look at satellite uh, aerial photo, then you can see also maybe in particular, if you are looking with a uh, stereograph, you can see slightly better the presence of a uh, topographic step associated to first fault. Sorry, yeah? I want to know uh, which is hanging wall and foot wall actually here. Which is hanging wall and foot wall over here, sir? Sorry. So the vergence is northward. So we are in the northern Tian Shan. The compression is north-south. And the hanging wall is all that part. And the foot wall is in that part. Okay. You can see here that this part is slightly more dissected than this part. So it corresponds to the fact that this terrace uh, has been uplifted more than uh, this part. And again, hanging wall, foot wall. Yeah? The fault may be emergent on, maybe, uh, sorry, non emergent. So can you explain how we can make out from this image? You said the terrace is non uh, the fault cutting the terrace is non-emergent. Uh, yeah, so you see a nice topographic step on the, on the field on the, on the surface. And uh, if you look here on the field, you see also a surface rupture. So your question is uh, for that part. Yeah. So for that part, from far away, we don't see a similar, uh, a similar trace. So there is some line, but I think it's a human made or something like that. And uh, we see some uh, difference here. But it, in fact, it's like a, a alluvial fan, which is deformed. And on top of that, there is more recent uh, sediments, and these sediments associated to this fan are uh, farmed and cropped. So you are looking just uh, the transition between farm uh, surface, relatively flat, and dissected a uh, loose surface, which associated to the uh, deformation. So uh, it's difficult just from that image to convince you that there is no um, uh, fault uh, that emerge at the surface, but uh, uh, on images, and then after, when you go on the field, 
you don't see this kind of topographic step associated or fold scarp, uh, as you can see in that area. So for that reason, uh, I tell you that there is no uh, fault emergent at that place. But at the same time, we see that, for example, there is a small canyon. It is dissected, so typically this surf surface has been uplifted compared to this one. So for that reason, we uh, infer that there is something making uh, uplifting the, the surface. So we infer some fold deformation and probably associated to some blind fold. I will uh, show you a, a picture, uh, a sketch, a structural sketch uh, uh, in a few slides. Okay, so in aerial view and on the field, always in Tian Shan, but another first fault. And you see that, uh, yeah, as I was saying, it's relatively sinuous, the trace of the fault. You see that the hanging wall is covering the foot wall, so we lose in some way the continuity of the fault, but still. The topographic step is obvious and helps you to uh, document the nature of the first fold. And if you are, uh, if you uh, work along a river and you get some fresh uh, riser and fresh cut with no vegetation, then you are supposed, if the fault has reached your face, to see uh, uh, a nice section. So here, for example, we have neogene sandstone which are uh, uh, thrusting, over-thrusting uh, quaternary gravels. And by uh, looking at the topography, you can see that you have some uh, topogra topographic step around 20 meters associated to uh, this thrust fault. So this is the image, as was mentioning. So we have on the southern uh, fold a fault which is associated to the, to the fold and that reached the surface. That was a red line as was showing. And in front of this structure, so for the nose, we have this kind of feature, probably some blind fault that with the tip of the fault at depth. And above that, some deformation by folding. And here, some uh, old fan surface which has been warped or folded and uh, left some small topographic uh, relief. So it's typically uh, the interpretation of what we saw previously in the uh, satellite image. Is it okay? Yeah? Uh, on a map, uh, if we see a map, so uh, in both case, like in normal fault or in reverse fault, one part is going up, another part is yeah. going down. Yeah. How can we see on a map and identify whether it is a normal or reverse until and unless we'll see the cross section? If we see, see the cross section, then everything is clear so that which part is going up and down. But if we see on the flat surface or in a map view, something is going up and someone something is going down. Yeah. But how to identify whether it is a normal or reverse? You are, you are perfectly right. So uh, sometimes it's not possible to to make the difference, but if you have the chance to see the different indicators or index, uh, I was mentioning about normal faults like triangular facets, the rebounds uh, at the base of this kind of things, it's relatively typical of normal fault and we, you will not observe it for a, a first fault. In general, normal fault will present a less sinuous trace than the first fault for the reason I was indicating. And uh, in uh, some cases or in many cases, first fault will be associated with folding. And so it, you can see on the map, for example, it's, if it is in semi-arid or arid uh, uh, region, you can see the, the fault trace and document, for example, the uh, anticlinal termination. So recognizing that you get anticlinals associated to uh, the thrust, uh, to the fault, 
give you an indication that you, it's more like a first fold than a normal fold. But, and in some cases, because it's hardly vegetated, and you just see some topographic step, and that's it, and no more indication, then you have to go on the field to know exactly if it's normal or first fold. And then, before going to the field, there is another indication you can get. It's just by looking at seismology. And if all in the region is documented as uh, first motion on the focal mechanisms, there is a strong probability that your structure is a first fault and reverse for normal fault. Okay, thank you. Uh, and one thing is that, uh, that you said triangular facet. This is a typical demarcation of a normal fault, like you said. So it's a triangular facet plane is parallel to the fault plane uh, no. of that normal fault? No, it's uh, typically a triangular facet is uh, 30 to 40 degrees when the fault is, uh, I was saying, uh, like 60 degrees. So basically, I was mentioning the ribbon at the base. So this one corresponds to the fault. So like the one I shown you in, uh, in Greece. But typically it's, it lasts, well, we can find it with an elevation of 10, sometimes 20 meter, but maximum. And after, you get degradation. And the triangular facet, it's already degraded fault mirror, so it's relatively planar, but it's just because uh, the uh, erosion of this uh, surface is relatively uniform. So you are degrading uh, your surface, but keeping more or less the planar, the initial planar surface. I'm not sure you hear. Yeah. It is clear, but in any case, the triangular facet doesn't correspond to the fault. It's just uh, less inclined than the, the, the trace of the fault. And uh, so triangular facet is not completely uh, diagnostic. I would say you can find triangular facet in some specific uh, setting which can be completely uh, distinct from, uh, from tectonics. So for example, if you consider a U-shaped valley carved by a glacier, then when the glacier, after the deglaciation and after the glacier are left the U-shaped valley, and sometimes then you will have small, so you will have the main river. Usually, for example, in the Alps, the, you will get some sedimentation at the bottom of the valley. So it, you will get the U-shaped valley with a flat surface after sedimentation. And you have small tributaries coming from the side. And this tributary will incise. And slowly and slowly, they will create small valley. And this incision can isolate some kind of triangular facet fr from the U-shaped valley. And you can also observe this kind of facet, like uh, in, um, for example, in Zagros Mountain, where you have nice fold, uh, fold with uh, alternation of limestone, hard limestone, and soft siltstone. you begin to, to have erosion of your limestone surface. And once you get erosion, then when, when you have uh, degraded the limestone uh, layer, then you arrive in more erodible sealstone. So when, when the river has hit the sealstone, they will develop, they will erode quickly, and they will abandon some structural surface corresponding to the top of, the, of your limestone layer. And from far away, 
it looks like also like triangular facet. So yeah, and it's, it's like in an, any class of feature in geology, nature is rich of any uh, wonderful uh, coincidence. And so it's again, it's uh, triangular facet can be a good marker of normal fold, but don't, if you see a triangular facet, don't say, oh, it's a normal fold. Maybe so there are some tricky uh, situation that makes you, um, uh, that makes things appear like a triangular facet, but they are not corresponding to a normal fold. Hello. Oh, sir. Okay. Yeah. Oh, can we go to the field photo, please? Uh, this. Oh, no. Oh, yeah, yeah, this. Um, so, w without any prior knowledge uh, uh, before going to the field, uh, how can we say that this is a trust fault, not a normal fault? Or maybe some simple f warping? So, which other thing we should look at in the field? to identify this as a trust fault, not a normal fault. Because it, it, it's yeah. a very gentle change. So which other thing we should look yeah, at in the period? Uh, it's the first step is to look from far away, from satellite image. So you see at the trace of the fold, the continuity. Before that, you have been looking at uh, GPS, seismology, you know the, the, the setting. So most of the time you already know what you're looking for. Normal fault or first fault. So the only places where you can get some doubt, it's where you have some a complex, very complex region. Or sometimes you can be in some compressive area and you have a fold, and locally, at the extra of the fold, of the fold, you can have small normal fold. So sometimes, even in compressive area, you can have normal fold. And if you are in some uh, zone with mostly horizontal motion, and you have bends along your uh, normal fold or termination of no bends along your strike slip fold or termination of strike slip slope, you can have a mix because of restraining band between locally, normal fault, first fault. So in that case, yeah, you can have a doubt. But in most cases, you already know what you are looking for. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a question to, to know uh, if you are looking for normal or first fault. And second, uh, you look on satellite image, and then you recognize that here, okay, there is a fan which is which is uh, to to seem deformed. So you go to the field, not too much to document the sense of motion of the fold because you get you have already a good idea of that. It's more like to begin to use this marker as a marker of deformation, measure it to know that it's. For example, a 20 meter offset, because from the satellite image, you don't get this offset of the vertical one, except if you have, for example, a high precision digital elevation uh, topography. But if you don't have, then you need to go to the field. And obviously, the more information you get, if you have a fresh road cut, a fresh river cut, or whatever, it's better. And so the, I would say the, uh, from field experience that the main difficulties, for example, for, uh, for this kind of um, um, scarp, it's not uh, uh, hesitating uh, in between normal fault scarp and first fault scarp, because usually you, you already know what is it. It's a, the tricky part. It's sometimes um, making the difference between a terrace riser and a fault scarp. Typically, if you have For example, a first fault, like that. A river arriving here, and in the, in the fallen basin, the river can switch 
So that will be the hanging wall, the foot wall, the subsidence. So here you can have an alluvial fan, and the river will be switching laterally. And each time it's switching, sometimes it can leave or re-size and leave a small riser or a terrace riser. And sometimes when the river went here, then you make a, raise, a riser, a terrace riser, very close to the trace of the fault. And sometimes you don't know. You don't know if the scarp you're looking on the field or on the satellite image, is it a terrace riser or it is a fault scarp. So this is the main difficulties, the main difficulty in, uh, usually in the field, and it can produce both for a normal fault or for a, a stress fault. And uh, I have uh, I've seen even uh, experienced geologists making a paleoseismic trench, and after making the trench, discovering that they have trench not a trace fault, but a terrace riser, because they don't see any kind of deformation. Because in some times, it's the, the terrace riser is almost parallel to the trace fault, so it's really uh, difficult to make the distinction. So once you have identified the, uh, the active structure, you have identified the sense of motion, then ne the next uh, things you want to uh, document is a uh, rate or the slip rate on this fault. And to document uh, this uh, long-term uh, slip rate, uh, average slip rate, you need to uh, use morphotectonic tools, it means geomorphic markers that has been acting as passive marker of the deformation, that has been recording the deformation of the strike slip fault or the normal fault or whatever. So you need to identify this geomorphic marker. So the definition of a passive geomorphic marker, it is a geomorphologic object which has been created by some agent, can be C, can be the glacier, can be a river, and suddenly has been abandoned. And since that, it evolved very slowly by surface processes. It's almost preserved. And it evolves only due to tectonics. So in that way, this geomorphologic marker can be considered as a passive marker of the deformation. So if you consider, for example, a hill slope, which is continuously evolving, then it cannot be, even if you see uh, some scarp uh, uh, associated with the faults, cannot be considered as a passive marker because it's constantly evolving. So what we usually consider as passive marker of the deformation, that's we have three types, marine terraces, fluvial terraces, and alluvial fan, and glacial moraines. So they are the three types of, uh, uh, basically, of uh, geomorphic marker that we use in morphotectonics. So marine terraces, so you see here in, in uh, New Papuasie, New Guinea, uh, a series of nice riser, and in between each riser, some flat area. So each flat surface corresponds to some, to some Terraces, terraces created by the repeated action or erosive action of the waves that will erode the bedrock and create uh, this, this kind of abrasion platform. So typically, the slope of this abrasion platform can be relatively uh, low, so that we end up with almost horizontal uh, surface. And it is considered that in many cases, this kind of platform is created during high stand of the uh, uh, sea, uh, sea level rather than during low stand. So another view of, uh, I think it's in, uh, in California, and maybe also in California, uh, this kind of 
marine terraces, and the marine terraces have been uh, uplifted, and so that here you can see abandoned marine terraces, which is 20, 30 meters above the sea level, and the present platform, which is uh, cut by the waves, and maybe in a few thousand years, because of the uplift, this platform will be also abandoned and will become some marine terrace. And this platform can be some kind of stress level cut into the bedrock, or you can have also some deposition on top of it. So deposition by marine sediment or deposition afterward by colluviums on top of the substratum. Fluvial terraces. So they are formed obviously along uh, rivers. Again, usually uh, they form relatively horizontal surface or almost horizontal surface initially before being deformed. And um, we can recognize different types of terraces. So it's uh, taken from a graph from uh, the book of Burbank and Anderson. And uh, there is a description of the different terraces. So it's a description which has been done, uh, nomenclature done for more than one century. So we identified degradational terraces. So they can be degradational terraces cut into the bedrock. And they can be also degradational terraces cut into alluvial material. So in that case, we call field cut terrace with degradational terraces. It can be also aggradational terraces. So when you fill your valley with some uh, alluvial and the top of the filling material will be called a field terraces. So here in that case, you have several nested field terraces. So one field terrace, an erosive event or period that dig into your field terrace, a new generation of filling or aggradation with a new generation of field terrace, and again, the same process of incision and aggradation again, so free nested field terrace. So you can have this kind of situation, and you can have also during re-incision of the field terrace, as I was saying before, some degradational terrace that we will call field terrace and cut into the field material. And at the end, you can have across the valley uh, multiple type of uh, terraces. So for example, here we have a stress terrace cut into the bedrock. Here a field terrace, here a field cut terrace, and here some of a nested field terrace. And all these correspond to the fact that the river is permanently degrading, aggrading, degrading, depending on the ratio of sediment flux uh, coming from upstream and depending also on the transport capacity of the river. Uh, last point, just some uh, importance when we try to reconstruct a terrace, terrace profile. Uh, we document two types of terraces, pair terraces and unpair terraces. Pair terraces, it's when on both sides of the valley, you can find terraces exactly at the same level that correspond to the same isochrone uh, terrace level, like here. So it means, in that case, that the channel of the floodplain has been reducing in width through times and during incision. In contrast, if the uh, floodplain has kept exactly the same width and has been shifting laterally, then you will expect unpair terraces. So each terrace has a on both sides has a different age as a terrace on the other side of the valley. And it's an idea of the uh, floodplain shift, lateral shift that creates those terraces. So it has uh, it is important because when we will look at the correlation between different uh, terrace level, usually it's when you have unpaired terrace, it's more difficult to correlate because from one side to the other side, it's two different generation of terraces with uh, diachronous surfaces. 
So example of picture of filter rays, uh, in, uh, it is in Nepal, in the Himalaya, 100, more than 100 meters of sediment filling. Well, you see it's quite old because uh, you see some red weathering. In New Zealand, uh, two generations of terraces. So it can be either two nested field terraces or it can be a uh, field cut terrace. So this ter terrace uh, cut into the material of this large field terrace. An image of a stress terrace. So cut into the bedrock. So you can find on the field sometimes st stress terrace, which has uh, exposed completely the, the bedrock. And most of the time, there is always a small veneer of sediment. So it can be a few meters. It's like five, eight meters of sediment that goes from gravels to sand or silt. But the important thing is that uh, we have this uh, uh, relatively horizontal level cut into the bedrock. So it is some kind of unconformity. And in some places, we can have, as, as I have shown on the, on the small graph previously, a different generation. So here we have, in Tianshan, a massive field terrace with, you see, small steps that correspond to field cut terrace during the degradation. And here, you can see the bedrock, the acid stone. So at the base, you have a stress terrace. So you have a mix here in between field terrace field cut and stress terrace. So sometimes it's a, it's a, a slightly complex uh, uh, generation of terraces. Of a geomorphic object, alluvial fans, they can be, in particular in arid places, they can be formed during some more uh, humid period. And since that, they have been abandoned and they can uh, behaves like a passive marker. Glacial landforms, in particular moraines. So we distinguish obviously uh, lateral moraines and uh, frontal moraines. So usually the, the best marker for morphotectonics are lateral moraines. So here you see uh, a view from a uh, uh, from a plane of uh, a normal fault that cut a moraine, I think in the in western US. So with a 15 meter step, you can see the, the car on the parking lot here that give you the scale of this, uh, of this uh, moraine, which is probably 100 meter high, and the step, the offset uh, around 15 meter. And Above in Venezuela, you see two generation of moraine, or no, two moraine associated to different valley. And you see here a small step, and it's not so obvious here, but here a small step or offset linked to a strike slip fault. So the other origin of the geomorphic markers can be climatic, like I mentioned for the alluvial fan. So it was created during uh, some humid period and then uh, the climate change and the marker is abandoned. It can be also linked to catastrophe. So you get some a big debris flow that creates a massive uh, fan and then after that, the fan will be re-incised uh, um, and abandoned. It can be for, uh, obviously for moraine, it is linked to deglaciation, so to climate variation. And we can have also some abandonment due to tectonics. So it will be the case, for example, uh, uh, for the uh, marine terrace. If you get some uplift, then uh, the uh, platform, abrasion platform, is above the sea level, and then the wave cut cannot be act to uh, create or keep on creating the, the platform, the abrasion platform. So it, the abrasion platform de become a, an abundant ter marine terrace and an abundant geomorphic marker. Um, so what the most important thing when using a geomorphic marker, 
we need to consider that the abandonment was relatively rapid to be sure that your surface is isochronous. Because when you are going to uh, uh, reconstruct the deformation, you want to consider the present state compared to the initial stage. And in this case, you consider your marker as some kind of uh, marker that form at some specific moment in the past. So for that reason, you need to be sure it's some kind of isochronous surface. And the second point, as I mentioned also earlier, once the marker is abandoned, you have to consider that it's evolving very slowly or almost not by surface processes. Because if surface processes is degrading or modifi modifying your surface, then it will modify the deformation of the signal associated to the tectonic uh, deformation. So the good thing, it's in uh, many places, in particular in arid, semi-arid place, uh, the surface processes associated to hill slope processes, in particular where the, when the surface is relatively flat. Chemical erosion, it's of the order of uh, a fraction of millimeter per year and probably uh, less than 0 0.1. Soil production and soil evolution, same. Uh, probably less than 0 0.1 millimeter. So if you have a marker which is, let's say, early or thin, uh, 10,000 uh, years um, old, it means that the evolution of your surface over that time will be less than one meter. So you can almost consider that for your marker, your surface, is not evolving and preserve the deformation as like a passive marker. Just as a matter of example to a simulation of the diffusive process. So I took a constant of diffusivity linked to surface processes, a typical of semi-arid uh, places. So it's a rate or a value you can find in California, in Tian Shan. Uh, in uh, Central Asia. And I consider, for example, here a 20 meter terrace riser and here a moraine, a moraine which is 100 meter. And over a period of uh, 20,000 years, you see that the evolution is quite reduced. So the general form is almost not changed, except at the crest of the moraine, you will lose like five meter. So the Typical very sharp crest will be degrading, but if you are looking a scarp, a tectonic scarp or deformation here, then you can see that there is almost no deformation on the side of the moraine. And same for the terrace riser. Obviously, the uh, top of the scarp has been degraded by two meters, but if you go at the middle of the scarp, there is almost no uh, evolution by surface processes. Excuse so, me, sir. Yeah. Uh, is there any significance of uh, frontal moraine in terms of morphotectonics uh, marker? Yeah, we, we can use a. Uh, we can use also uh, a frontal moraine, but uh, most of the time, uh, the frontal moraine can be some uh, the. Uh, the combination of uh, several bulge. So the initial topography of frontal moraines in general is more rugged and less continuous and less uh, marked like lateral moraine, which present a very nice triangular shape. So for that reason, mostly to uh, document the initial shape of your marker, it's much more easier to infer the initial shape of your marker when it's a lateral moraine than uh, when it is a frontal moraine. So it's depending. If your frontal moraine is a nice, sharp, crested moraine, it's fine. You can use it. It's not a problem. But in many cases, it's, it's more like a, a, a well, well defined, uh, not so well defined uh, topography. And what is the is there any significance for unpaired terraces? For paired terraces, we have a chronologic sequence from up to down. 
but for unpaired terraces we have a uh, less correlations with both sides so uh, how can we use as a uh, geomorphic uh, i will uh, i will uh, discuss this oh. point uh, okay. in a few slides thank you Sir, can you just explain the evolution of star terraces? Means how it is formed. Star terraces, basically. Yeah. How it is formed. Means first upliftment takes place, then incision with quaternary or something. Uh, basically. But just from uh, by the process I uh, mentioned yesterday, bedrock incision by river. So the river uh, is flowing in its floodplain. So across an active structure, sometimes the floodplain is relatively narrow. But always the river is slightly shifting uh, uh, during its incision. So it creates some kind of uh, relatively uh, horizontal and flat beveling uh, or cutting level. And once, for some climatic reason or because of uplift and uh, sudden uplift associated to an earthquakes, the river will uh, cut into this uh, former floodplain. Then if the incision is incising on a width smaller than the initial floodplain, on both sides, on one side of the uh, valley, you will abandon this uh, uh, cut level in the, in the floodplain and it's becoming a stress, stress terrace. Sir, in the field, how can we differentiate whether it is due to tectonic or whether it is due to climatic? Because the incision is continuous from quaternary to... It's not possible. It's not I mean, possible. It's, technically, it's not possible. So you have, no, you have to... I mean, the same process, whatever it's incision due to uh, tectonics or due to climatic change, you cannot do the difference. Uh, so it's uh, mostly the... We anticipate a little about the the next slides, but it's if you are able to to follow or to document the stress elevation all along your river, it's uh, mostly the the shape of the of the deformation which give you some insight about what's going on. So for example, if the stress is like that, or if the stress is like that, you know that in that case, I mean, you cannot do almost, uh, it's very difficult to do it this kind of bump with climate. It's mostly probably it's partly linked to uh, uplift and tectonics. In this case, it can be difficult. Because it can be some kind of broad scale uplift linked, for example, to some flexor, flexural rebound. Or it can be also some climatic change that makes the river in size. So, largely upstream and, and more gradually, uh, less gradually and uh, downstream. So uh, in that case, you, you cannot know. So then if you have several generation of terraces, maybe you can answer that. One, one guide it's uh, usually when you observe in a region only stress terrace, in many cases it's rather indicative of tectonics. And when you begin to see uh, stress and also filter races, it's indicative, the filter races are more indicative of climate, uh, <coughs> climate signal. Because if you have several generation of terraces uh, over more than uh, 100,000 years, it means uh, more than over one glacial interglacial cycle, so probably the climate and the erosion, sediment flux and discharge have been oscillating. So sometimes you will be degrading, 
maybe creating stress terrace, and sometimes you will be aggrading, so doing field terraces. So if you find field terraces and stress terraces, maybe it's indicative of this fluctuation. If you find only stress terraces without any field terrace, so it means that you are missing some the, the time when the river is feeding again. So probably it's not climatic, but rather tectonics. So they are not definitive answer, but it's just some kind of guideline. In this particular slide, there is a K value. Is that diffusion coefficient? Sorry, what about the coefficient, uh, the diffusion coefficient? No, no, I'm asking that k value, what it is? It's a diffusion coefficient. So how to calculate that diffusion coefficient over a period of time? How did we define it? It's yes. Just, yeah. Uh, well, it's just an example to, to show you. So it's purely synthetic, but um, it has been defined mostly uh, whatever it is in Western US in Central Asia. So if you're interested, I can give you a few reference, but uh, it has been defined mostly from terrace, terrace riser. So usually it's, uh, if you look at the slope, so Z, the initial slope is like that, and because of the diffusion at small scale, so degradation, sedimentation, then slowly you will get this kind of picture, and and the slope will will follow some kind of Gaussian shape evolution. So people have been dated, for example, this terrace. P1, P0. If you know the age of T0, so when this escarpment, this uh, riser was created, and you document the evolution of your, uh, of your Gaussian or of your scarp, the, the only two parameter that makes your Gaussian to, uh, uh, to spread out or to your, your scarp to degrade, it's time and coefficient of diffusion. So if you know the time, you can document the coefficient of diffusion. So this coefficient of diffusion has been mostly defined with uh, degradation of terrace riser. So the, the, the typical value, it's, uh, yeah, it's around two to five, a little more, 10 minus three uh, square meter per year. But again, it's for semi-arid uh, region, so maybe if you go in the more, uh, for example, in the Himalaya, in uh, wetter climate, maybe it's higher than this value. But uh, to my knowledge, uh, I don't know uh, studies in India or even in the Himalaya documenting uh, this value for, for that region. So the next two steps is to measure the present geometry of your deformed marker, to date it, and then to make some hypothesis on the initial uh, geometry of your marker to reconstruct the deformation, and then, if you have dated it, the deformation rate. So to uh, measure the deformation of the present geometry, uh, there are different uh, tools to do that. You can do with a classical uh, total station with differential uh, GPS. You can use also 2D topography. So you can achieve uh, a 2D topography either by uh, uh, correlating uh, images taken from uh, aerial photo from now from a name aerial vehicle and you can also so use laser scan. If you have the chance to uh, 
uh, to have a, a plane flying with a LiDAR. You can also have a nice uh, high precision digital topography uh, using this kind of LiDAR, uh, airplane uh, LiDAR. So typically you can get up to uh, one point every 20 centimeter. So really high resolution. And the nice thing with the LiDAR, it's uh, usually it goes through the vegetation uh, in between the leaves. So you can have uh, really an idea of not the top of the vegetation, but the surface of the ground. So in some case, and it is a case, for example, in the uh, front uh, of the Himalaya, all the hills, all the topographic scarp are covered by forest. And if you fly with a laser, uh, with a plane, with a LiDAR, there is a good chance during the dry season that uh, uh, you uh, recover a good signal from the ground. And then it's definitively illuminate the scarp which were uh, 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 hidden below the vegetation. So to reconstruct the present uh, geometry of your, of your marker, in some cases, is relatively obvious. So it is obvious when you have continuous terraces. So for example, here in Tian Shan again, you have this red terrace, which can be followed almost entirely across this active structure, which is a, a, a fold. A fold. So in that case, okay, we follow this terrace. So you see a nice stress terrace, the folded uh, bedrock, the anticline, and then a veneer of alluvial deposit above the stress level. And this terrace is continuous across the fold. So it's relatively easy to reconstruct its geometry so in that case, it was done by a digital, uh, by differential GPS. But if you have a, a high resolution uh, digital, digital uh, topographic model, then you can do it also by, uh, by measuring your, uh, directly on, the, on your uh, digital elevation model. So it's relatively easy to reconstruct the present geometry of your marker. Tricky things, it's when you get only a few terraces. So it means, or maybe I have a picture like here. So it's from uh, my paper in 2000, uh, 2000 paper. So typically you see different level of terraces and it's really uh, relatively discontinuous. You have one patch here, another one here, one here, and several generation. So the question is how do you correlate this one with this one? This one with this one, and this one, for example, with this one. So do we correlate this level to this one, or to this upper one? So that's the difficulty. So during this step, then you need to know exact, uh, to, to have uh, other kind of information. So it can be, for example, the uh, thickness of the veneer. So in, it was the case, for example, in the Nepal. The lowest terrace had a veneer of sediment which were between six and eight meters with a thick silt uh, at the top. And the highest terrace was uh, having a veneer between four and five meters. So recognizing the sedimentologic cold characteristic of the different terrace level, uh, it was possible to make correlation. In the case of Nepal, for example, also the there was some uh, idea about the uh, degree or the approximate age of the different surface because of the particular warm and wet weather, uh, weather in Himalaya, then weathering is uh, occurring rapidly. So the early Holocene uh, terrace uh, were presenting some orange color, the late Pleistocene some red weathering color, and the youngest one we're having almost no weathering. So depending on the degree of weathering of your terrace surface in the upper uh, uh, first meter of, of your terrace, you can have an idea of what kind of generation you're looking for. 
and the way if you want to correlate this point to this point to this point or uh, differently this point to this point instead of this point to this upper point. So in some cases it's not so obvious so maybe if uh, you want to go further you need to do a specific dating on the different level to be sure that this one has the same age as this one. You can look also at the sometimes the um, mineralogical content of your terrace if there was some uh, terrace associated to some sp specific uh, erosion of some part of the basin upstream maybe one terrace will be presenting more uh, uh, carbonate content than another one so there are different way to correlate but either by degree of weathering sedimentological arguments eventually geochemical argument and finally and it's the most costly in time and in money by doing multiple dating once you be you are be sure that your correlation is good then you can consider that your interpolation between the discontinuous terrace can be uh, can correspond to your initial surface or your initial, no, your present geometry of your marker. And if you have several dates on it, it's, you have one argument, uh, one other argument to say that you are looking to an isochronous surface. If you have the same age here and here, okay. This is isochronous marker. I can use it as a geomorph passive geomorphic marker of the deformation. So here it was the way it was done. The correlation between discontinuous terraces based mostly on sedimentologic and weathering arguments to reconstruct this different set of terraces. And once we correlate them, we got almost a continuous uh, profile, modern profile of the marker. So then we need after having documented the geometry, we need to date this marker. So basically, there are three uh, methodological approaches. Absolute dating based on some physical phenomenon. Data calibration against a calibrated time curve. So it, it's more like a, a aggradational feature when you can, uh, for example, uh, record sedimentation over uh, thousands of years and calibrate with O18 curve or with paleomagnetic curves or whatever. And relative uh, date based on the evolution of a physical or chemical property over time. So it can be, as I said before, the weathering. But it will be mostly a qualitative argument. Sometimes people have tried to use it as a quantitative uh, method. So typically, uh, uh, for example, we can mention the weathering rinse. So weathering rinse is the thickness of the weathering of pebbles on top of a uh, surface, for, exa for example, on top of terraces. And it can be shown, uh, for example, here in the um, US or in uh, New Zealand or in Bohemia in Europe, that the rinse thickness will be increasing with the age of the surface. But what you can see here also, it's if you consider Yellowstone on New Zealand, so depending on the climate, depending also on the lithology, is it andesite, is it granite or, or whatever, then the weathering ring will not evolve in the same way through time. So if you use some relative dating method, you need to have some at least one calibration point to know uh, and preferentially two or three calibration points to exactly determine this curve. And then you can use this curve regionally using the same lithology uh, for uh, your purpose. But now there are so many uh, absolute dating techniques that I would say that uh, this relative dating uh, method are still used in some cases, but most of the time uh, researchers are looking for absolute dating. For absolute dating, so you will have a more, uh, so tomorrow I will be presenting 
uh, uh, ages related to uh, cosmogenic nuclides? Uh, what way they estimate the uh, ring dating? What is this? Widening ring dating. How how they estimate? What what is the procedure? The they process is it's uh, weathering is mostly due to uh, uh, to the oxidation or to some chemical processes or reaction, and because it is linked to the uh, availability of moisture and oxygen. So obviously, weathering is starting from outside and going toward the center of the uh, pebble. So it's just the way that uh, through time, the weathering front is propagating from uh, the outside toward the inner part of the pebble. And so it's just a matter of time. So if the surface is fresh, if your pebble is fresh, there is no weathering rain. And if your pebble is exposed to weather, to rain, rain, uh, a little of uh, uh, cryoclasty or whatever, but mostly rain and, and uh, you, you will create this weathering rain. But in some other case, cases, you can have also in desertic environment almost no weathering and what we call some varnished Desert varnish. So it's. Uh, I, I'm not very familiar with that, but it's some kind of deposition of uh, oxide. I don't remember if it's manganese or uh, iron oxide. And in that case, it's a slightly different technique and be uh, dated by uh, other techniques. Uh, you can also. People have been also uh, trying to make some relative dating uh, based on the fact that your pebble is degrading by weathering and microfracturing by uh, people have been measuring uh, uh, wave speed or sound wave speed or acoustic wave speed so just you put a sensor here you hit with a hammer your pebble on the other side and you record the uh, the time or the the wave speed and given the fact that the uh, acoustic wave speed is very sensitive to the uh, presence of fracture. So for a very fresh pebble, the, you will expect a high speed velocity for your wave. And the more weather red, the more uh, micro fracture is your pebble, and the older it is, then the sound waves will be uh, more slow, slower. So there are multiple techniques to document the uh, evolution by weathering of your pebbles. And weathering rings in the world is one of, of the techniques. And, and for that reason, if you consider a basalt or a granite, because the, the minerals are not the same, they are not going to weather at the same rate. So for that reason, if you do a calibration curve, it's just for one lithology. And if you use another lithology, you need to another calibration curve. So absolute dating. Tomorrow I will uh, speak about uh, cosmogenic radionuclide. I think uh, many people in this room are uh, uh, familiar with luminescence, and I think it's uh, someone will be uh, teach you about uh, luminescence in a few days. And also uh, we use quite a lot uh, radioisotopes, so it can be C14 in organic matter, uranium forium mostly in carbonates, carbonate from corals or from speleothem, potassium argon or argon argon in uh, all volcanic material, volcanic ash, chards, and so on. Each technique, uh, well, before uh, coming to the different techniques, yeah, we can group them into two different uh, range or um, type of dating. One type of dating will give you the burial age. So the time that your sediment has been deposited and the time that if you're looking for, the, for example, for a charcoal, the time that your charcoal was buried into the alluvium of your terrace. 
And the other type of dating is based on exposure ages. So it's not the burial time, but the time that a pebble or a rock was exposed to the surface. So it could be exposed to weathering, but in this case, it will be mostly exposed to cosmic ray, which will produce the accumulation of uh, radionuclides. So that changes slightly the philosophy of the dating because you are not dating. If you consider, for example, a terrace, by having a burial age or an exposure age, you are not dating exactly the same moment. So sometimes, or at the scale of very old terrace, you almost don't see a difference between the burial age and, and exposure age. But in some other cases, you can have a, a, a slight misfit. So it's important to, to keep Keep that point in mind. And second things, when you go on the field, on, your, uh, on the marker you want to, to date, then you have this whole bunch of techniques, and you will choose the one you want to use, depending on the setting and what you can find. If you are in a setting where you, you want to uh, document ages in between 0 and 50 kilo years, you will be look, looking for C14 dating on organic material, but if you are in a desertic part, sometimes it's really uh, difficult to find wood or charcoal. So you will move to a luminescence technique, and depending on the range of uh, age you want to see, if it's relatively young, young, you can go to OSL in quartz. If you want to see things slightly older, like 100,000 years, you will move to IRS. IRSL in feldspar, and if you want to see something or to date something still older, you will move to, I didn't mention it, to uh, electron spin resonance, which is another technique in luminescence, but, go, but can go up to two millions. And tomorrow we will see also the limitation for cosmonuclides. I want, I want to know, uh, you have said the weathering rings are a useful technique for the dating. So uh, it's uh, how the weathering intensity is uh, related to the time, means uh, date, basically. How, what? For, for an area, yeah. we are, uh, for a weathering ring, we are identifying that, oh. uh, how the weathering intensity is varying yeah. through one point to another. Yeah. So how it is, uh, connected to the uh, time, means the weathering intensity is how much date that you have shown that kilo year? In, in that case? Yes. Uh, I'm not fami very familiar with the technique, uh, so I cannot answer you very precisely. Depending in, in some uh, semi-arid environment, the weathering front will, will develop slowly, so I presume that we can go uh, up to uh, dating, like here, 200, uh, maybe more, uh, 200 of uh, several hundred thousand years. In some more wetter and warmer climate, the weathering green will be faster. Uh, the weathering propagation will be faster. So probably you will be limited to a time range of 50 or 100,000 years maximum, or something like that. After that the pebble will be completely disaggregated and then uh, you don't find anything. How, how we decide that it is uh, 100 kilo year or 150 oh, kilo year? You need calibration points. So uh, you need to have an idea of the age of the terrace because you have dated independently with C14 or because oh. uh, at the same time you have been measuring exposure age in your pebbles. So I, well, in fact, I mentioned these techniques, uh, because it has, it has been used in the past, but uh, obviously if you have a Cosmo lab close to your, to, to, to your university, then, and if the paper is containing quartz, most of people will try to do first uh, cosmogenic uh, dating in this kind of uh, pebbles. But, Cosmogenic dating is costly in terms of time and in terms of money. So maybe you go first, make some dating with cosmogenic uh, uh, nuclides on uh, several uh, terrace sets. And if you have to study many terraces, 
and you want to have a quick idea of the ages of the different terraces, uh, qualitatively it can give you uh, some first argument to say, okay, uh, this terrace is this age, young, old, according to uh, the, uh, some kind of calibration curve I was able to do with my first dating with Cosmonuclide. So it can, that can be some kind of um, uh, complementary technique to go on the field uh, to, to have a, a semi-quantitative ID very quickly uh, about the, an age of the terrace once you get the calibration curve. App that you have shown, terrace map. Yes, here uh, the plot uh, is showing uh, that altitude uh, of the same isochronous terraces. Mm -hmm. So what does it tell about the, means what conclusion we draw with this um, uh, plot that you have shown, isochronous plots, uh, that altitude versus. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure to have understood that you. Plot these are isochronous terraces, right? Yeah, uh, it's, uh, well, specifically here and here, I've been, well, I documented some continuity in the sedimentologic aspect. I was saying, for example, the yellow terrace was presenting a height meter of, a uh, of alluvial cover and with no weathering, almost uh, uh, just a little of weathering, and this one was presenting uh, orange weathering during the, uh, for the first two, three meters. And after that, I just guessed, or I made the hypothesis that the uh, terrace creation was relatively quick, and that we were, was possible to consider this terrace as isochronous. But you're right, or I don't know if it's your question, but uh, in theory, to be sure that this is uh, really uh, an isochrone, it would be necessary to have several dates uh, of that. It's not the case. It just, so it just the, the, uh, the, the hypothesis, it's, it was created relatively uh, uh, fastly and abandoned at the same time all along the river. So we make the guess that it's isochronous. Here for the green one, I had two, date, uh, two ages, one here and one over here. And here it's 9.2 kilo year and here 9.1 kilo year. So in that case, at least I have two dates to confirm that I'm looking for some kind of isochronous uh, surface. Sir, uh, just uh, one clarification, if you could kindly. Uh, bedding dips, the bedding dips from DEM measurements, could you just clarify how uh, you, that was done? Because is it a DEM that is, you know, a top-down view or a side view, if the exposures are on the side? And uh, could you just tell me what is DMG measurement? Oh. Yes. oh okay, it's a, a little out of the... <laughs> But uh, yeah, very quickly, field measurement, uh, I made the measurement classically with uh, uh, the compass. DMG measurements, uh, DMG it's, uh, means Department of Mine of Geology of Nepal. So it's, uh, it was done by people also from the, from, uh, by Nepali geologists. And DEM measurements, uh, I had a, a 10 or 20 meter pixel size DM of that region. And in some places, nice sandstone layers were possible to follow. It was possible to follow nice sandstone uh, layer over several hundreds of meters in between crest and river. So by using the DM, the geometry of uh, of the layer, then by fitting the bedding dip in order to, given the topography, to be able to get this, uh, this geometry, it was, able to, uh, uh, it was possible to uh, get the bedding dip approximately from 
uh, the digital elevation model and from the satellite Thank image. You. Okay. So typically, for example, here you have a, a fluvially sculpted bedrock in. So it's perched, I don't remember, like, let's say uh, 30 meters above the, the present river. So it was sculpt, sculpted or carved by the river a long time ago. So typically here, you don't have aggradation of material. So the only things you can do is expose your age. Here, there is an erratic block uh, left during, uh, by a glacier during deglaciation. So again, you can date the time that the block was left at the surface uh, doing exposure age by uh, using Cosmo radionuclide. When you look at the race, you have the choice. You can try to find C14, try to find uh, a, lens, uh, a lens of sand to make some luminescence technique. So you, you will get some burial age of the alluvial, uh, that gave you an age of the alluvial deposition, or you can make some exposure on the pebbles at the surface, or we will see tomorrow also we can do profile, and it will give you the exposure age, so the end of the alluvial deposit and the moment of the uh, abandonment of the terrace. So in that case, this, this age date, the age of the abandonment of the Race, and this age will slightly predate the uh, uh, age of abandonment of the terrace. Uh, as for any method, there are always problems, difficulties. So, for example, for C14, you can have two distinct problems. First one, Inheritance, if you look, for example, for charcoal, if you date a charcoal, you don't know what happened to your charcoal before the deposition. Sometimes it has been sitting on the hill slope for thousands of years, or maybe it was in another terrace and it has been reworked and redeposited. So sometimes a ch a charcoal can be older than the true terrace age. And in that case also, what we see is that charcoal taken from the uh, top part of the alluvial deposit, so mostly in the silty material, then you get younger and younger age. So I presume at that time, but probably because of burial, because some charcoal maybe are roots of trees which has been uh, 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 burning. Uh, maybe the tree develop later, uh, much later after the abandonment of the terrace. Anyway, it's, you can see that probably these charcoals are, came later or after the abandonment of the terrace, and you cannot trust this charcoal or the age you can get to date the terrace. So in that case, for example, typically in Himalaya, I will be looking mostly for charcoals coming from sun lens below some gravel layer to be sure that there is no uh, burrowing by animals or tree roots or whatever, which makes the charcoal coming from the surface too young and coming down into that silt package. Last point, the initial marker geometry. So in order to be able to reconstruct the finite deformation, we need to know the initial marker geometry. So if the uh, deformation is really a uh, short wavelength. So if it's a, a, a very localized offset, so it will be the case with strike slip fault. It can be also this, uh, the case with normal or fresh fault. So it's, uh, we can be measuring with marine terrace, terrace riser, alluvial fan, infernal stream, and moraines. And it's relatively easy to document the initial geometry, because in most cases you can consider that initially there was continuity of the marker, continuity of the moraine crest, continuity of the uh, uh, ephemeral stream, 
or if it's vertical continuity of the marine terraces. If you are trying to measure long wavelength deformation associated to some fold or blind uh, fold, then uh, it's becoming more difficult to infer the initial geometry because it's more, you have to infer the initial geometry not at the scale of your offset, but at a broader scale uh, of several kilometers. And typically, this will be the case for vertical deformation. And in that case, uh, two main markers we'll be using, it's marine terraces or fluvial terraces. So I was saying, to document offset across a fold, because it's, normal, it's uh, very localized, uh, the main assumption is the marker was initially continuous. So for example, in, on St. Andreas Fault, you have this stream, which is flowing that way, and you see a paleo channel, which has been abandoned. So classical assumption, so again, the same thing with a, a different uh, alluvial uh, surface associated to the streams. So the classical assumption is to say, okay, at the beginning, the stream was flowing into, uh, following the steepest, uh, uh, the steepest uh, uh, direction. So it was draining straight. So it was a, a straight line, or almost a straight line. And any bend we can measure today, any offset, is an offset between this initial geometry and the uh, initial geometry was like that, and the modern geometry, which is bend. And all this bend is not due to any kind of uh, initial geometry of the river, but it's all this bend is due to tectonic deformation or strike slip offset. So by making this hypothesis that regularly the river is flowing straight away, uh, then we can infer the initial geometry and measure uh, deformation or an offset of around 300 to 400 meters. Same for a terrace riser. We infer that the terrace, you see the modern terrace riser between the active channel and some kind of recent terrace. You see it's almost continuous. No step over, almost continuous. So when you see some step, some offset, we infer that initially it was a straight line, the initial geometry, and all the offset correspond to some tectonic deformation. Okay, so by making the continuity of this line or of this line, we can have the offset of the, of the riser. For the terrace riser, there is one difficulty in some way to get the age of the, uh, of the deformation rate. So it, it was illustrated by uh, Kogil in, in 2007 uh, with this two uh, sketch. So imagine that this is a flood plain incised into this orange terrace, okay? Then you get some displacement on the strike slip fault. And then this flood plain is still active with the river shifting laterally. So what's going on? The river shifting laterally will be uh, eroding the banks here and here. And so, in that case, once the river has incised again the yellow surface, then the yellow surface is completely abandoned and there is no more erosion of the banks. So you will begin to see some offset of the riser between the orange terrace and the yellow terrace. So if you want to date, uh, to, to uh, to know the uh, slip rate on, on this fault, you need to measure this offset and to divide by the age the offset begin to be created. And in that case, the age, so we can have an age, we, we can date the orange 
the rays, and we can date also the yellow the rays. So in that case, which age we'll be using uh, for uh, documenting the sleep rate on the fold? The age of the yellow terrace or the age of the orange terrace? The yellow, yeah, because, because we consider that the riser was regularly refresh, refresh and made a straight line until the end or until the, the moment was, uh, when the yellow terrace was abandoned and uh, when we get this incision. So the moment of creation of the offset or beginning was after abandonment of yellow terrace. So in that case, we will divide this offset by the age of the lower terrace to get the age of the strike steep rate. But it's not a necessity. necessity. Sometimes you get some creation of this uh, flood plane in yellow, and then the river is not very active, staying more or less at the same uh, level or shifting slightly, but not making so much bunks erosion. And then you preserve your initial riser here, and then the riser begins to uh, record some offset. And then again, this abandonment of the yellow terrace and the offset you can measure, it's much larger than in the previous case because this part has not been refreshed. So in that case, if you want to have the slip rate, you need to divide the offset you measure here on this riser. You, have, you need to divide this time by the age of the upper terrace, of the orange terrace. In reality or in uh, most cases you don't know exactly which scenario is a good one sometimes there are small field cut terrace or insert terrace that give you some idea of what's going on but uh, in many cases you don't know exactly so in fact you basically uh, uh, you can basically bound the strike slip fault uh, rate you can say that you will get some maximum slip rate by dividing by the lowest, uh, by the age of the lowest terrace, and a minimum slip rate dividing by the uh, age of the upper terrace. For moraine, for example, it's not, it's not a problem because you are dating or uh, an offset of the object, not of the riser, but basically of the moraine. And the moraine has been left at the time of the deglaciation. So you can directly divide the offset by the age of the moraine and you get the slip rate. So in that case, we have both sides of the fold, the foot wall and the angi wall of the normal fold. Sometimes, so like for the Karakum fold here, there is preservation of the moraine only on one side of the fold. Here and uh, in the southern part, it's not the case. Well, the, the north, it's toward the, the bottom. So the assumption you have to do here is that the moraine was deposited in front of the valley. So in that case, the valley flanks give you some continuity of your marker, or have to be in continuity with the moraine crest, and you, have, you can calculate the offset between the moraine crest and the valley wall on the other side of the fault. For first fault, if you look at abandoned terrace, again, it's more or less uh, uh, the offset you can record correspond more or less to uh, the age of, uh, or has been formed since the abandonment of the terrace. So again, if you want to know the slip rate or the uplift rate, you can just divide the offset by the age of your terrace. Uh, so now, if you don't have some offset, but like, for example, the blind fold and some folding, then you need to document, in order to know the shortening rate uh, on the structure, you need to document uh, the wall deformation of this 
uh, fault structure of the antique line. And in that case, to retrieve the deformation linked to the antique line, you need to uh, document the uh, initial geometry of your marker all along, all across your antique line. So in that case, you need to do an assumption. Assumption the continuity of the initial continuity of the marker, but it's not sufficient. You need more, and the more it's depending on the setting. So in the favor uh, favorable case, when you have marine terrace, you know that the terrace has been created by the wave cut, so you know that the initial geometry of the initial position was sea level. So if you know uh, by a static curve the location of the sea level at a given age, then you know the initial position of your uh, marine terrace, and you can compare the present elevation of your terrace compared to the past sea level during its creation, and the difference of elevation divided by the age give you directly the uh, uplift rate. So in that case of a new Papuasi New Guinea terraces, you can see that the several uh, fly of terraces have been uh, dated and document some increase in uplift rate for the last uh, 100,000 years. Another example of uh, sea level uh, uh, marine terraces. So this is in Grecia, in Greece, the Corinth Gulf, and you see a series of marine terraces which have been abandoned due to the uplift in the foot wall of this normal fault. So you have here the normal fault. So what will be a cross section, a normal fault, and the foot wall is uplifting with some uh, back tilting. And the different terraces you see here have been indeed back tilted. And again, knowing the uh, aesthetic variation and from the present elevation, you can retrieve the uplift of your marine terraces and through some normal fault model, uh, infer the shortening rate, or not the, not the shortening, the extension rate, or the fault slip on, on this fault. In the case of uh, fluvial terraces, there is not such a reference as a sea level. So, usually we need to do some assumption. So the most common assumption is to consider that the topography of the system is more or less in steady state or at steady state, and in particular, the river is at steady state. So it's uh, staying more or less at the same elevation. So in that case, the initial geometry, for example, for the green terrace here, will be to consider for the initial geometry the present river position. So in that case, we just equate the incision. It means the, differ the difference between terrace elevation and present river elevation. <coughs> we will equate incision and uplift. So as he was uh, asking before, how do we differentiate incision created by climate from incision created by tectonics? So sometimes it's not so obvious. One possibility is to, uh, do I have it just here? Uh, one possibility is to compare different terrace level. So in the case of the Sheolix uh, fold, uh, we can compare, compare the three different level of terraces, the one T1, T3, and T0 with different age. And once you look at the incision rate profile, if you get relatively similar shape. That's a good indicator. It's uh, tectonic and not climatic. Obviously, there are other arguments here. Um, do I have it? No, I don't have the profile on this. Well, I don't have the profile here. But another argument, it's in the case of the Himalaya, if you see at T0, the present the modern geometry is like that. So obviously here you have negative slope. So it cannot be uh, due to climate. Otherwise, uh, there is uh, some obvious problem. 
So if you have negative slope, it means that uh, nowhere. It's, it's tectonic. Uh, but I will show you an example where it's indeed we, we can question uh, uh, by this hypothesis. So first, if we have a continuous surface, so it was the case in the Tian Shan. So in that case, it's not necessary to rely on the uh, river elevation. If the surface is continuous, then we can say, OK, the actual structure is located here and here, and upstream and downstream, the surface has not been modificated by tectonics. So it's an hypothesis, maybe sometimes a strong hypothesis. But if we make this hypothesis that this part and this part were undisturbed, then considering that most of the time alluvial fun or fluvial terraces, aggradational fluvial terraces, present a graded or uh, relatively continuous gradient, then you can draw a straight line between the upstream and deformed part and the downstream and deformed part. So this is the straight line in dot, dotted line. And you consider that this is your initial shape, the uh, shape of your initial marker. And then making the difference between the present geometry and this hypothesis initial geometry, you can get the uplift, which is on the order of 30 or 20 meters for this uh, surface. OK? So when the, uh, when the uh, terrace is discontinuous, it's more difficult to do uh, this kind of uh, uh, hypothesis. In particular, if you don't have a terrace remnant here, or here, you don't know how you will uh, uh, adjust the, uh, this uh, initial slope. So in that case, as I was saying, you will consider the present geometry of the river. But it's not always a pertinent guess. So in that case, it was working. In some other cases, it doesn't work. So go back to this Tian Shan fold. If you look at the river profile. So the present river is here. And the terrace we were looking here is the red one here. And you see that if you consider incision profile, so if we would have started with the hypothesis that the initial terrace uh, geometry was, was close to the present river geometry, then we would have here 200 meter of incision, 150 meter of incision, and just making the difference between present geometry and river geometry or river profile, then we will end up with a incision profile like that. So if you say erosion uh, uplift is equal to incision, then you would say, oh, OK, so if it's 10,000 years, oh, I get 20 millimeter per year of uplift. But here, in that, in that setting, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense because tectonically, it's too, uh, uh, too high. But mostly because here, we have also information about here and here about the fact that if you consider undeformed part here and here, uh, we can s reconstruct the initial surface not here but somewhere here. And it's just because we are in some Piedmont where we got a lot of aggradation and degradation. So in that, in that case, we cannot uh, consider the classical assumption that the initial geometry of your marker is given by the present river. So be careful with this kind of hypothesis. So I would say, as I was mentioning earlier, Generally, when you see mostly stress terrace and only stress terrace, you are in favorable case to consider that modern river is a good proxy to uh, estimate the initial geometry of the marker. If you begin to see many field terrace, then it means that climate is doing quite a lot in uh, 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 river variation. And in that case, 
it's very dangerous to consider uh, the modern river position as a proxy for the uh, initial geometry of your terrace. So after that, uh, when for faults, when we get the profile of the vertical deformation, we want to know the shortening. And so we will see it. Uh, 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 Later, that's uh, this afternoon. That's um, October. And uh, so, take on message. You have to consider morphotechnic markers. Basically, remembering you need to look for isochronous surface. And the one that can be reconstructed, I mean, interpolated between different uh, uh, remnants. You need to have a good understanding of the initial surface geometry. And in general, short wavelength deformation associated to uh, uh, just fault offset will be much more accurate than long wavelength deformation. OK, thank you. So I wanted to know the third point where you say short wavelength deformation is more accurate than long wavelength. Yeah. When we are talking of this, is it only in terms of local or regional scale in distance or uh, individual terraces like um, <laughs> across uh, a, a number of faults? Or across only one fault, so like short wavelength. Yeah, short wavelength. It's basically, a, well, either a fault or a very short uh, fold, folded uh, structure. And uh, long wavelengths, it's folding over uh, several kilometers, tens of kilometers. And worse, if you're looking, for example, uh, you can imagine very long wavelength uh, deformation. So I don't know if you are familiar with uh, what we call dynamic topography. So when you, you get some uh, motion in the mantle, where the mantle is uh, uh, rising up, is uh, making, due to some viscous force, is making some, uh, uh, is pushing the lithosphere. And you can uh, create deformation of up to one kilometer, or uh, uplift one kilometer, over wavelengths of several hundreds of thousand kilometers. So in that case, it's uh, yeah, it's almost impossible by geomorphic markers to uh, retrieve the deformation because it's very long wavelengths and it's very difficult to infer the initial geometry or the exact initial geometry of your marker on such long wavelengths. If you are working on very short structure or across a fault, the hypothesis that, for example, the moraine crest was continuous, it makes sense. Like the, the, that the riser of, uh, between two, uh, two terraces was something continuous, it's also, also some hypothesis which is quite reasonable. So for that reason, the uh, shortest the wavelength of your deformation is, the easiest yeah, or the, the the more accurate is your uh, initial ge the, your guess about the initial geometry. So it's it's just a matter of reconstructing the initial geometry of your marker. It is easy at short wavelengths, and it's becoming more and more difficult when the wavelength of the deformation is wide or large. Thank you, sir. And again, and also it's a, it can be also a matter of a, a, a variation to, uh, or to the notion of isochronous marker. When you look at very uh, long uh, deformation, you, you need to look at very long geomorphic marker. And there is more probability to have some dichronism 
along your marker on long distance than on very short uh, distance. If you are looking at a terrorist riser or a moraine just cut by a fold, you know that on both sides of the fold, it's exactly the same marker, so with the same age. So the, eye is a, uh, the synchronism on both sides of the fold is obvious. When you look at terrace over a distance of several tens of kilometers, sometimes you can have some diachronism between the upstream part and the downstream part. So diachronism plus mostly the uh, difficulty to reconstruct the initial geometry makes that long wavelength deformation is more difficult to retrieve than short wavelength. In the beginning of your slides, you have mentioned the uh, paleo altitude. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you uh, tell that how to determine is based on the pressure and temperature of the atmosphere. Yeah. Uh, but uh, can we say that uh, in the paleo uh, time, uh, the same atmospheric pressure is throughout the uh, uh, geological history? Because so much time, we, uh, the oxygen have evolved in the past and uh, so that thing is maintained throughout the geological history, the pressure gradient and temperature gradient. That is just uh, my query to you. Uh, I'm not sure to, uh, to have exactly understood the end of your answer, uh, of your question. Uh, yeah, value altimetry is, uh, well, it will be another class. Uh, uh, it's, it's a difficult topic uh, because uh, uh, most of the paleo altimeter that you can uh, uh, handle with uh, uh, present many, uh, many bias. So it's, uh, for the moment, it's defining paleo altimetry uh, with accuracy. It's one of the most difficult parts. So I'm not sure to have understood your question, but if your question is uh, about how reliable is uh, O18, uh, when you consider for example, uh, some uh, measurement in paleocarbonates in a surface, the O18 signature. So you will associate the O18 to some temp paleo temperature, and the paleo temperature can, uh, which, is, which will be more, for example, different from the present temperature at the same place, or the, your sampling place. This difference of temperature can be linked to some global change in climate, a regional change of climate or precipitation pattern, and it can be also uh, linked to some change of elevation. So all the difficulty is to know which part of your temperature change is due to global variation and which part is due to local variation, for example, uh, induced by change in elevation of your surface. And it's not it's not so obvious. It's not so obvious. So it's, uh, if you have indication about the evolution of your climate, maybe you can uh, correct the, the, your O18 value by the modification by the global climate to uh, have the local variation speci uh, specifically linked to the, to the um, uh, change in elevation. But for any kind of uh, uh, paleo temperature, uh, a paleo altimeter based on temperature, it's the same thing. So uh, people have been trying to reconstruct paleo elevation of Tibet, for example, look, looking at uh, uh, paleo uh, fauna or paleo flora, so a type of uh, animals or uh, vegetals that, that can be found in the sedimentary uh, uh, archives of small basin in, in Tibet. And uh, uh, quaternarists have found, uh, for example, um, Maybe I, I say something, uh, uh, I don't remember if they found uh, hypo or uh, croc crocodiles in sedimentary archive in place uh, uh, which are 5,000 uh, uh, 5, meter high with a temperature, uh, present temperature of zero, uh, average temperature of between zero and 10 degrees, something like that. So we know from present fauna that crocodiles cannot live in that place with such a low temperature. So we know that this sediment 
was uh, uh, deposited in some environment where the climate was warmer. So there are two solutions. Either the global climate got much colder or the uh, surface uh, or the sediments were deposited at much lower elevation and since that time the, uh, the Tibet has been risen. And it's still debated. Some cotton eyes said, uh, okay, the crocodiles today, they are living between zero and 1,000 meter uh, for this kind of temperature. So the Tibet has been risen by 4,000 meter in five million years. And geophysicists or geodynamicians say, oh, it's not possible. So another option is that global climate has been cooling down and part of the fact that uh, the crocodile was living at that part uh, at that time, it's because global climate was warmer and they were able to, to stay in, uh, at that elevation because the global climate was warmer. So it's always difficult to make the difference uh, in terms of uh, paleo temperature or what is due to global variation and what is due to local variation induced by uh, uplift. So, uh, like you said, we can use, uh, when we see strath terraces, we can uh, link that to tectonics. And we are, when we are seeing a lot of fill terraces, so that uh, we can link to climate. But that is the case for bedrock rivers. Mm -hmm. yeah. But when we look at alluvial rivers, like in intermountain valleys, and especially when we know that, that there is uh, deformation there. So, uh, how do you look at the, it and to calculate uplift rate or uh, uh, yeah depending on the setting but uh, uh, so, some I mean a stress terrace is basically an unconformity so even if you are in the foreland of the Himalayan system with a, a very uh, young but develop in the uh, foreland basin. You can have stress terrace or unconformity between the alluvial veneer and the folded uh, conglomeratic or sandstone layer. Even if it's also sediments deposit, you will see a difference between the bedrock because of the unconformity and what you can consider the alluvial veneer. If the bedrock is not exposed, so if... Uh, oh, if the bedrock is not exposed? Yes. So. But I mean, at other, if you are looking for deformation, obviously, if you are looking for deformation of a few meters, it's, it's really difficult. But if you begin to have deformation of a few tenths of meter, so it means that the river has incised by uh, several tenths of meter. So if on the cut made by the river, you don't see any stress terrace, any inconformity, just field terrace. It means it's just field terrace. So it means that probably it's, uh, it's more like a climatic signal rather than a, a tectonic signal. And if there is some tectonic, then over the 10 or 20 meter of a, a cliff a high, you would expect to see some inconformity and uh, associated to some stress or in between the young sediment and the older sediments. Okay, so basically we have to look for unconformities in yeah. that case within the sediment layers. Yeah. And we have to correlate uh, between yeah. the like the hanging wall and foot wall sequences, we have to correlate Yeah, because between usually them. when you are folding, you create some, uh, some tilting of the bed. So yes. uh, at some moment you, you will begin to see some unconformity between very young deposit and older deposit. And if it's just climate, then you would expect, uh, you can have unconformity in, uh, well, you, you, you can have reincision. So young deposit on top of uh, old deposit with some uh, 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 incision le uh, level, but you would expect the two uh, uh, 
the bedding of the young and the old deposit to be conformable in some way. Or, yeah, uh, even in, if it is just climate, we will not get any deformation markers like uh, tilting beds or any fold structure. So that is also something that we have to make uh, sure it's, in field. I mean, uh, if we go back to this example, uh, there is a paper, if you're interested in, uh, by uh, or several paper by Malatesta in 2000. Uh, 15 and 17. So it's been dating by OSL, uh, different level here, and he, he proposed that the river has been incising over the last uh, three or four glacial interglacial uh, periods. The river has been uh, degrading, 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 degrading. So typically, for example, the last surface or the last uh, early Holocene surface we, we look here. It's the result of, after a degradation phase, of a massive aggradation of several uh, tens or even more than 100 meters of sediment. So this terrace can be considered as a field terrace. But even this field terrace, if you get some continuity of the marker upstream and downstream of the uh, anticline, you can use also this surface as a marker. Because as long as you, you are able to reconstruct the initial geometry, you can use it as a, as a marker. So this is the only requirement, be able to, uh, to, uh, to reconstruct the initial geometry. Whatever, if you have continuity of the marker on both sides of the uplifting structure, or if it's not the case, uh, if you can do the hypothesis, other hypothesis in particular about uh, uh, the link between incision and, and uplift and uh, the possibility to use a, a present river. If, if you have a filter race just here, uh, the only remnant just here without having that part and without that part, in that case, you cannot, you cannot tell anything. You don't know if it's due to climatic incision or tectonic incision. So yeah, in some cases, you cannot answer. Thanks.